record. Okay, so this is how the internet works. We'll talk about some of the big picture details. So the internet allows things that were almost unthinkable not so long ago, right? I can remember back in the early 90s, I'd heard of the internet. I knew people that did things with the internet, but didn't have it, access to it myself, and I uh, didn't have it at home. So that's the way the thing was. Uh, so you can send private messages anywhere worldwide almost instantly. That's a whole, you know, that was a big change in how the world worked. These days you can stream music, you can stream movies. Uh, arguably humanity's greatest engineering achievement, right? So it's always on, it's mostly free once you pay your ISP, even for uh, you know demanding applications like voice over IP and video streaming. It's almost never noticeably congested, although individual sites sometimes are, and last, mostly uncensored for better or worse. So it's pretty incredible and it's pretty young, right? 30 years ago, we basically did not have this. And the internet was, wasn't designed top down by a single company or a single government organization. It was, in fact, it grew out of a rather natural process of unrelated networks. So we're going to get in the Wayback Machine. I'm going to start off, I'm going to draw a really low quality map of the United States. So let's say there's Florida. I don't know. That's horrible. I can, even I can do better than that. Oh, there's Florida. There's some other stuff. There's, right, whatever. Something like that. So initially, there were a few pockets, right, of activists, put one for Chicago, one for uh, the Twin Cities, and there were others, but this will do for now, right? All of these different locations had groups of computers. So very first one, uh, let's, let's take it all the way back. So in the 50s, Organizations typically didn't have more than one computer. So there was no need to network anything, right? There was nothing to network them with. Computers were big standalone devices, like big automatic couches interface them with. By the 60s, organizations were starting to have multiple computers, right? Which again, which to share data among them. Thus, networking was created. By the end of the 60s, specifically in 1969, the first interconnected network was built. Group of four networks on the West Coast. So that's it. That's the simple thing. Now, way back when, right, when networking was pretty new, there wasn't one single way to do this, right? There was, you know, there were machinery out there and people could offer suggestions on how to do it but there wasn't anything in the way of standards. All this stuff had to be engineered. So initially, every network was free to develop a custom communication scheme, what's called a protocol for sharing data between devices. Okay, but when the networks were connected to each other, they also needed some common language, some common protocol, so that they could share data across networks, right? Basically, they need to speak the same language. So initially, you might have had clusters of computers, and that one speaks orange, and say that one speaks blue, and this one can speak, I don't know, brown, and this one can speak purple, whatever. All these different setups with their different protocols, yeah, they had to connect. Now, what happens is 
when networks connect to each other, right, when these groups of networks connect, they need to agree on the protocol, which means, for example, orange might agree to use red, right? So when we connect these two, da -da -da -da, and they're going to communicate, then they say, okay, yeah, we can speak red. And there might be another similar process going on over here on the other side where these guys, you know, say agree to speak brown. Let's do that. And, you know, this one connects over here and they all agree to speak red. Eventually, right, these, whoops, these networks get bigger. And what's going to happen is at the end, well, they got to pick one way or the other to communicate. They're all going to maybe speak red. Okay, so this sort of process, this sort of evolution does not really require any mandate from higher up. It evolves naturally from the need to communicate in a fairly standard way, right? There's no need to maintain many, many, many different protocols when everybody's gonna have to share the same one anyway. So also when a small network joins a big one, it will probably go with the flow, right? And learn the new protocol. But if the small network has some good ideas, those could always be implemented in the next revision, okay? And that's basically what happens is over time, these protocols change and people have good ideas and the organization that manages says, well, we're not gonna implement that today, but yeah, that's a good thing. We'll write it down. And when we issue the next revision in a year or two, sure, we'll include that feature. That's basically the way it worked. So the internet is decentralized. There's no one single entity that owns it or controls it. There's a bunch of different uh, entities that control parts of it. It evolved from isolated networks and interconnected networks. And before then, right, networks just existed but operated in isolation for whatever entities had them. Now, over time, over the decades, right, again, a lot of alternative protocols were proposed and tried. When new networks joined, they typically used the prevailing protocols, which eventually became established as standards. And over time, the best standards were identified and adopted. And here we are. Okay, so the internet efforts were initially funded and created by the Department of Defense for scientific and military communications. That was the big justification for it. And if you've ever, if those of you who remember former Vice President Al Gore, he uh, was accused of claiming that he invented the internet and it's grown into something of an urban legend. Uh, he was actually an important guy on the committee that got funding for it through ARPA, but, and he was a strong advocate of it back in the day, but of course he's not an engineer, he's a politician. So he was involved with the funding side of it, not actually building it. Anyway, so this is the basic structure of it. Now, in the middle, you have the backbone. The backbone is largely composed of high speed, high capacity fiber optic cable. Okay, it can handle a lot of traffic super fast. Now, most of the time, a lot of the communication doesn't have to go over the backbone. If you're only communicating among local people, for example, if you're sharing a message between two users in your same local area network, right, say in the same house, it doesn't need to go up to the backbone and all the way back down. Instead, what'll happen is something like this. 
there we go, it'll all stay local. However, if you're one of these people and you're trying to communicate, whoop, I didn't want to do that, and you're trying to communicate with your buddy on the other side of the world, right, then yeah, that's how it's going to go. It's going to go from like here to, ooh, I didn't want to do that, from here to here, right, and then from here to here, and then from here, whoop, let's say up that way. It will eventually get to where it needs to go. So essentially, messages are generally sent over the shortest route, shortest or fastest route, uh, and avoid unnecessarily taking up space. Right, traffic space, traffic capacity. All right, so different organizations will own different parts of this. So for example, the big telecom companies own parts of the backbone, okay? Some may also own parts of regional networks or local networks and ownership structures vary wild, widely across countries. So in the US we have our set of uh, companies and other countries they have other ones and there may be a more uh, more or a lesser or greater extent of ownership of backbone and these local networks together. Okay so that's the basic structure. Now Although the internet is uh, depicted here as a web, basically as a tree, right? So that there's essentially one path between any two users. In practice, there are actually many, op many potential paths between users. Okay, we'll see that in another, another slide here. So I'll add that. Although routes here are drawn as, you know, basically one route connecting any pair of users. In fact, at every point, there are redundant components. Okay, in case, so for backup, in case one fails, and redundant paths, in case a group of components fails together. Okay, so even though again, it's all depicted basically as a set of branches and you look here and say, oh, there's only one route between this guy and this guy at the top. In practice, every one of these steps, there's going to be a lot of redundant components and that provides additional capacity and provides a uh, backup in case components fail. Now, Ordinary end users, we don't connect directly to the internet backbone. We go through an internet service provider or an ISP. So there's three tiers of ISP. And remember from our networks uh, architecture talk, we talked about uh, tiers being groups of servers. Uh, but here we just mean groups of machines doing the same kind of thing. So each of the telecom companies, the tier one, they're primarily carrying part of the backbone. The T3, the tier three ones, they aren't. So here's the definition. Tier one, the really big telecoms, the ones you know you think of as big telecoms, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, for example, they own chunks of the backbone and they can connect to any other network using what are called peering agreements, which means free data exchange. So if AT&T sends some data to Verizon, Verizon doesn't charge AT&T for it. And likewise, if Verizon sends some data back to AT&T, AT&T doesn't charge Verizon for that service. Your tier three ones are the, what are called the last mile providers, right? So these are the ones like here, where we say the local con network connecting to the users. In the old days, those uh, used to be, you know, basically a mile or so of copper wire connecting people to the last relay station of the internet service provider. That's why they were called last mile providers. 
Uh, those, they only use what's called paid transit to exchange data with other networks. So for example, if one of those small ISPs wants to send some data to AT&T, AT&T is going to charge them for the privilege. AT&T has a lot of backbone and other stuff to manage. If those smaller carriers, right, if those ISPs want to go through AT&T, they have to pay AT&T. The last one, tier two. So tier two are the ones in the middle. And so those ones, first of all, they connect tier one and tier three networks. What it is, uh, they, well, they have a mix of peering and transit agreements. That's that's the strict definition. So for some companies, right, they, they can uh, get peering with these uh, big companies and for others, they can't. So tier two are this sort of middle ground. Now, once upon a time, these tier classifications were very useful because they pretty precisely described the rules that businesses had. These days, though, it's a little murkier than that, uh, sometimes a lot murkier. So Comcast is a good example. Once upon a time, Comcast used to be a tier three provider. They uh, strictly uses paid transit. But now Comcast has decided that it makes sense for them to own a little bit of the backbone and thus with the big telecoms, they can exchange data for free. So officially it's classified as tier two because in a few oddball cases, it does use paid transit. But in the United States, almost all of the traffic it handles is handled through peering agreements. And so for, you know, for all practical purposes, it's basically a tier one company, even though it's officially is a tier two. Anyway. So a simple example here, your tier, tier three ones are also called access ISPs. And this fairly correctly shows the possibility of redundant routes. So all these black boxes down at the bottom, those are all end users. And for example, if I wanted to connect from this one over here, I could go up, up, up all along the edge, and then I'd have my choices of ways to come back down. And you can see there are other alternate paths. I can go here to here to here to here and back down that way. In general, there are lots of alternate possible paths. That's fine, but the tier one companies, they handle the big traffic, they have peering agreements, the access ISPs, they have transit agreements, and they have to pay to go over the backbone, and the tier twos are kind of in the middle. Okay, so a little bit more about peering versus transit agreements. So let's ask this question. Have you ever wondered why you only pay your domestic postal service to send an international letter? This is the root of the solution. So. For example, suppose you're sending a letter to France. You just put a US airmail stamp on it and it gets to France, right? But it doesn't make sense if you think about it. They still have to deliver that thing within France somewhere. Why don't they put French postage on it too? Well, the assumption is for every letter going out, there's going to be eventually one coming back and ultimately both postal services will about break even. You send a postcard to somebody in France, well, that person in France is gonna send a postcard back to you sometime. And so for the post offices, it's much easier to just worry about the total sum of traffic when it's needed rather than individual pieces of mail. So for example, one of the cases that's come up lately is you may be aware that there are a lot of manufactured goods in the United States that come from China. Well, of course, there's not a uh, corresponding flow of manufactured goods going from the US back to China. So there's a definite postal imbalance there. Anyway. So people are working on that, but that's an example that can happen in real life. Now, again, the same idea and the same problems arise in networks. So if you are a tier one network, in general, the assumption is that the aggregate backbone traffic flows balance out so they don't charge each other, right? If necessary, they can perhaps set up some sort of accommodation where they pay each other a little bit, but you know, they certainly uh, don't routinely charge each other to use each other's services. And the reason is, again, they assume that for every message going one way, there's going to be a corresponding amount of data going back the other way, and it's gonna wash out. Now, of course, some of the problems with that is you can have systems where there are very heavy traffic flow imbalances. For example, an operation like Netflix, right? Has very little upload traffic. All it is essentially, you pick what movies you want to watch, but download traffic, yeah, for every time you watch a movie, that's a couple of gigs of data going. So. Netflix has a very, very big data imbalance. And, you know, the systems are trying to resolve all that through negotiations. Similar thing, Comcast. Comcast has a, uh, you know, again, a similar issue that basically they own enough of the backbone that they qualify as a tier one ISP, but they don't have 
quite as much backbone as some of the others, and so they're sort of taking advantage of the system as well. Now, this is an older article, right? It's back from 2014, but it'll give you some insight into the basic problem. Okay, questions on any of that? Does that all make sense? Oh, here we got some chattage. Okay, uh, right, right. So, well, we'll talk about the other in a second. So yeah, if you're sending a message across the world, right, you're not gonna connect directly. You don't just plug your machine straight into the backbone, right? You go through your ISP and your ISP maybe forwards it through one or more intermediate networks to get to one that has the backbone, then goes, you know, at uh, basically instantaneously around the world over the backbone, and then it goes to a local, you know, a local ISP on the other side. And so yeah, it can, traffic can go through multiple carriers on the way to their destinations. Okay, now routing traffic across the internet. So the internet has millions of host computers, right? Millions and millions, uh, and we'll call them service servers. And they provide data and services as requested by the clients, the ordinary users. Now, typically what happens, your PC or smartphone or whatever is gonna be the client machine that requests data from a host system. For example, you go to some website, you're basically requesting a copy of the web page. So that request and the data get formatted into what are called packets, little envelopes of data that uh, typically less than 1.5 kilobytes. And when they're being transmitted across the internet, those packets can potentially travel across multiple networks and eventually get reassembled at the destination. So what happens, you go to a website, you request a web page, that web page contains a bunch of data, that entire website message gets chopped up into packets so it can be sent more easily over the network. And once you've gotten that complete sequence of packets, then you can reconstruct the web page on your own machine. So that path of network devices between the client and the server is what's called the routing path. It's how the data gets to where it needs to be. Now, in this diagram, right, so I'm gonna, whoops, I'm gonna lift this so I can edit it and paint a little bit. Which usually goes a little better. There we go. So what typically happens, there's a couple major flavors of doing this. We'll talk about them, uh, well, we'll talk briefly. We'll eventually talk more about them in the uh, YouTube, YouTube lectures. So TCP is the standard way where uh, all packets from a message are sent over a single stable route. Okay, you construct the, that is, First construct the route, then send the packets in a complete series. When all packets have arrived, the message is complete at the client. Okay, that's the idea with TCP. What we see here, this is UDP, and here in this model, the various packets from the message could travel along different or even unique paths, okay? So there's different ways to do it as a point. We'll have more to say about TCP and UDP later, but essentially you have a source, it chops up the message into packets, and it could either send them all along the same route or it could send some of them along different routes. Eventually they'll get there though. Okay, now again, there are many, many, many different uh, schemes thing. And one common, you know, generic way to do it is a variety of shortest path algorithms. So there are algorithms for defining that, uh, but you know, the idea is when you're using something like TCP, typically it wants to use the shortest path, you know, in terms of time so it looks at the fastest route it can use and it'll send data over that one and then individual routers they'll all maintain a table of ip addresses on outgoing links so if you're using tcp then you say oh if i need to send a packet from here to this guy i know that the next step is maybe to send it to that device and then this router can send it to that one that router can send it to that one but typically each router is only going to remember the next router on the path that it needs to send to because that's all he needs to know he needs to know if i want to send this message 
to the destination, I can send it to this guy and it'll get there next, right? And then from on stream from him, they'll take care of it. But again, there are a lot of different routing protocols. Uh, if you ever decide to go into computer science, you can learn some more about that. Uh, for what it's worth, that was basically my dissertation topic too about 10 years ago. So I used to know some stuff about this, but I've forgotten quite a bit as well. Anyway, so that's it. That's uh, what you need to know about routing, right? Uh, there are going to be routing paths. That's how the data gets to where it needs to be. And it's chopped up into packets. So you have a message that your data gets broken up into packets and those packets get sent across a sequence of devices to get from the source to the destination. Okay. Now, organizing network functions, next thing. So networks include a lot of different components and technologies, right? Uh, so ethernet for wired connections, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, a uh, couple kinds of uh, wireless connections, different physical things, fiber optics, cable modems, DSL, uh, different approaches, circuit switching or packet switching, and a bunch of different applications. So you have a whole bunch of components and technologies that all have to work together. So question is, how do they do it? Well, here's a problem scenario. Imagine if you had to set up a single interface for every pair of application and technology. For example, if your web work differently on Ethernet versus on Wi-Fi versus on Bluetooth, and same for email and same for BitTorrent. Well, that would mean that if you introduced a new communication technology like cellular networking, that would mean that every one of these applications would need a new way to do it. And on top of that, every time any of these got upgraded to a new version, they would need to find, you know, develop a new interface for that. It would be a giant nightmare. Likewise, every time you came up with a new application, it would need to be compliant and have a special interface, unique interface for each one of these technologies and every version of those technologies, right? This would be a nightmare. So what that would mean in practice, there would be a huge amount of work to build a new app because you'd have to build lots and lots of interfaces. There would be a huge amount of work to develop any new media because you'd have to make sure that it was uh, compliant with all the basic uh, applications out there. And it would be a huge drag on growth of technology and adopting new technologies. So we really don't want that. How do we solve the problem? Well, I'm going to add here they uh, put in, it's also true that it could be that multiple users are not having the same endpoints on their community, not having the same endpoint technology. For example, one user is using Ethernet, another using is Wi-Fi. That's a problem too. So you might even have to develop translations between media. Okay, so the solution though is to use what's called indirection. So here they list it as a magical network abstraction layer. What we mean is simply all of these technologies are essentially going to look at packets in the same way. So if I have a web browser and I'm using Ethernet, the data is going to get processed into packets the same way. The packets that Ethernet and Wi Fi and Bluetooth use are all going to be structured the same way. Now, if they're all structured the same way, then it's very easy. Then the, the application doesn't care which technology I'm using. It structures the packets in the same way, sends them out, and they'll get handled properly. So that's called an API, application program interface. So a connection between two applications that sort of functions as a translate. So if I add in a new application like voice over internet, I don't have to worry about developing a special custom interface for each of these technologies. I just make sure that my packets conform to the basic requirements of all these, and then I'm fine. Likewise, if I develop a new technology like cellular communication, as long as it accepts the same packet style that all these other technologies expect, there's no problem. So this means, so that's order one. That just means that anytime I develop a new communication requirement, whether it's through an application or through a technology, I only need to develop one interface. I need to make sure that it uh, processes the existing packet style correctly, and then it's real easy. Then I don't have to worry about the rest. And that means there are very few limits on new technology. It's easy to write new applications because I can just assume that the packet problem has been solved. Likewise, I can develop a new communication technology and as long as it takes the same packets as all these others, again, I don't have to do anything different with it. Okay. 
So some of you should perhaps be thinking, how does that even work out in real life? Well, we're going to talk about that. Let's see, no questions? Uh, all right. I'll get to the other questions after the lecture. I see them there. Okay, so the layered network stack. The idea with the layered network stack is fundamentally that anytime an application sends out data, it goes through a sequence of processes here, starting with N, going all the way down to layer one, until it gets to the physical media where the message actually gets sent out into the network. So basically, I start with some data from my application. It, get pro it gets processed in various ways until it's ready to go out into the network. And these layers are designed in a modular way. That is, the application, for example, doesn't need to know the inside details of how layer N works. What it needs to know is, if I send it the proper data in the proper format, it'll handle it and accept it and do what it needs to do. Likewise, my application also needs to accept data from layer N. So whenever layer N returns a string of correctly formatted data to my application, the application can process it. So each of these layers fulfills a necessary role that we'll talk about in a minute, but they're all isolated modules. So none of these layers needs to know the details of what goes on in the other layers. Okay, so the interfaces define what's called a cross-layer interaction. So they say, if I want to, if layer N, say layer two here wants to communicate with layer one, all layer two needs to know is the proper format to send data into layer one, and then layer one will worry about the rest. This makes the approach very, very flexible. For example, I can take these same layers and use them in some other system, right? I don't necessarily, they're not going to be customized specifically for one particular piece of hardware. Second, I can change details of how the modules are set up. For example, if in layer N, I decide to include a new encryption scheme, right? I take this application, I want to encrypt it before sending it out into the network. I can implement that without affecting what any of these other layers have to do. So that's a big thing, makes my systems much more flexible. Now, this is what's called a loosely coupled system. We will also have more to talk about that later. So, loosely coupled me means this, uh, the individual modules don't need to know the details of how the other modules do their work. So, you can certainly potentially improve performance of your system by sharing information across layers. Uh, for example, your application might construct its data in a different way if it was aware that it was in a secure environment versus a not secure environment. If it's in a totally secure environment, maybe it skips an encryption step or uses a weaker level of encryption. If it's aware that it's in a dangerous situation, maybe it uses strong encryption. If it doesn't know that, then it has to go to default and you know use the standard encryption model. So there are various ways you can improve performance. Uh, likewise, in terms of scheduling transmissions, if this layer one somehow it had access to information from a higher layer and knew how many devices were in the network and when they were going to transmit and it could be confident about that, then it could be more efficient about scheduling its transmission times. But again, when you share that kind of information across layers, then you break up this modularity, which means if I change something within a layer, then any other layer which relies on that information, you have to see if that's gonna change how the system works. And some of those interactions can be uh, potentially unpredictable. Okay, let's talk about how uh, this layered approach would work in a simple shipping example. So suppose I'm sending a package to a buddy of mine in Australia, okay? First thing I would do, I would take that package, you know, put the thing in the box and send it on its way, right? So I, uh, let's say I'm sending this rainbow kiwi, this is what I use. Uh, for one of my, when you're a parent, you have a lot of stuffies lying around the house. So I send this rainbow kiwi to my buddy in Australia, and I put it in a box, right? I put it in a box, I put a stamp on it, I write the address on it, it's ready to go, all I got to do is take it to the post office. Well, I take it to the post office, and they say, oh, this is for Australia, great, I'm going to send it to Australia. And it's probably not going to get flown over there in a straight shot, right? Because from Chicago, that's probably around 18 hours or so to get to the west coast of Australia. So there's gonna be some intermediate stops on the way. And this is analogous to, this is the router at my house and it goes through some local area, you know, local networks, regional networks, whatever, to get to the other side of the world. 
So the meat stops for my package. Maybe it's first flown out to Los Angeles, then uh, maybe to Hawaii. Then finally, after that, it reaches Australia. If my buddy lives in Sydney, then sure, the maybe the arrival point is Sydney. It goes to the post office there, and they take it and send it to my friend. He gets the package. Okay, but each of these steps is in a way layered. For example, when I give the package to the post office, the post office is going to assume that the message is correct inside the package. Likewise, when I hand it off to the post office, I don't need to know any of these details about how it's going to be sent, right? I mean, I can specify airmail versus ground or versus boat, whatever, but I generally don't have to worry about that. I certainly don't have to worry about which particular flight the uh, package is going on, right? The post office worries about that, not me. So that's an example of a modular process. My role in it is to get the package properly assembled into the post office. Once I hand it off there, the post office takes care of the rest. That's basically the same way the networking works. Okay, so one of the standard models is the seven layer OSI model. Now it's an interesting story, back in the day, OSI and TCP were two competing standards. Uh, OSI was a fairly tightly structured one. TCP was a much looser standard. So OSI was never actually implemented anywhere. That's an interesting fact. It was, uh, so around 1970, there was starting to be this battle, shall we do it this way or shall we do it that way? And what happened is the OSI guys had endless meetings and arguments and discussions about how they were going to do it, but they were never actually fully able to agree on how they were going to do it. Meanwhile, the TCP guys, they said, well, good luck with your meetings. We're going to go build the internet. And because they had a looser, more accepting structure, they didn't put in so many rules. It was easier to join. They didn't have to resolve all those problems. They could, in many ways in their networking, adopt a live and let live kind of approach. Basically, as long as the data was properly formatted, they could accept that there was more than one way to do things. But we're going to start with the OSI model because it very clearly presents all of the standard processes that uh, networking goes through. And then we'll talk about how it changes for uh, TCP. Okay. So the first thing is the layers themselves. So application, presentation, session, transport, uh, network, data, link, and physical. Okay. If you're the sort of person who likes mnemonics, of course, we have a good one for this. All people seem to need delicious pizza. Okay, so that's the all people seem to need delicious pizza. There you go. Now, what do these do? Well, the application layer, this is the application. Say an email. Okay. It produces the data that gets sent to the presentation layer. The presentation layer handles formatting issues like encryption. Right? So if I have a message that I want to be encrypted, send it out into the network, presentation layer will take care of that. So the application layer sends the presentation layer the email message, presentation layer will encrypt it if necessary. The session layer for purposes of this, it does it does a few other things like manage uh, connections. So let's just say it manage connections and session state for related applications like audio and video. Okay, so for example, if you're watching videos on YouTube, right? There's a video stream and there's an audio stream, and you need to have those synchronized so that you know the the voice doesn't get all off off time. 
Other times, applications be, can be connected in a variety of ways. For example, if you're on Facebook, but you're using some other app, there needs to be some shared place where those access credentials can recognize, oh, yeah, I'm on Facebook and I have this session token, but I'm using their instant messenger and I need to be connected to Facebook to do that. The session layer will handle the connections between those different applications. Okay, the transport layer chops the message into packets. That's the big thing. So whatever output is produced at the end of this uh, session layer with bundling together related applications, the transport layer is responsible for chopping that message into packets, right, into with a sequence, with sequence numbers. The network layer basically puts the address label on each packet. Okay, so wherever this packet is going, the network layer is going to put that destination IP address on it. And obviously, the network layer is going to have to reach out and find what that IP address is too, but still, that's its job. The data link layer is going to, number one, schedule transmissions and also convert the packet data into a bit stream, right? A sequence of ones and zeros. For transmission. And the physical layer actually transmits the data into the network. Okay, so this is how we go through this whole process. We start off with some application data. We go down through all these layers. So again, one at a time, we start off with an application, we write the email, we put an attachment on it, we press send. The presentation, presentation layer will do any sort of reformatting like encrypting it. The session layer will bundle together any related applications. For example, if my email needs to be synchronized with something else, sure, it'll consider that. Uh, that'll produce a data stream. The transport layer receives that big bundled data stream and chops it up into packets and gives each packet a sequence number so they can be reassembled when they get in the correct order. The network layer for each of those packets puts a destination address on it, and the data link layer receives those packets with the IP address destinations on them and says, okay, we'll be ready to send those whenever we're ready. I'm going to pass each one along to the physical layer as a bit stream. Okay, and when stuff gets received on the other side, similar things, right? So the physical layer actually receives the incoming signals. The data link layer basically checks if the incoming packet is, I'll say, should be processed by this machine. Okay, basically look at it. If a device could transmit and send it out to multiple devices simultaneously, the data link layer is where that machine looks at the packet and says, is this packet for me? Am I supposed to process this? If yes, the next question is, if the packet is for me, am I the final destination for it? Okay. If so, then I'm going to continue processing it, right? The transport layer is going to handle this uh, sequence of packets. And the network layer will send them up. But if not, if the network layer re recognizes that I'm not the final destination for this packet, it's going to kick it back down to the data link layer so it can be sent onward to another machine. The transport layer right, is basically in charge of managing the packet sequence until all have arrived. Okay, So the transport layer receives all of these packets and it bundles them up into a complete message. The session layer separates any distinct applications uh, that have sent packets. Okay, so if you have multiple applications that got bundled together on one side, well, the session layer assigns each of those packets to the appropriate data stream for their individual applications. Presentation layer reformats, or let's say unformats, For example, decryption, and the application layer re 
receives the email in a correct format. So that's the basic process. With uh, the OSI layer, with the OSI 7 layer model, you go from having an application send out data all the way into the network, and on the other end, the receiving machine receives it and processes it. And again, this is not the only way to set up a system like this, right? It's a reasonably efficient way to do it. For example, there's nothing that says you couldn't uh, do the encryption after chopping the message into packets, but this is the way, you know, it's standard done. Okay. Now, two parts, switching versus routing. We'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, well, let's, let's just we'll talk about it right now. So there are two different ways that packets can get handled. So switching is for direct connections between devices uh, within local area, typically within local area networks. And that traffic is proce processed at the data link layer. And the core question, like talking about data link layer, is if I, one machine receives a packet, the sender might be connected to multiple devices, and maybe just because I receive a packet, it's not really intended that I'm going to process it. Routing, on the other hand, routing is for devices that are in different networks. And that network traffic gets processed at the network layer. So for example, if one router on a path receives a packet, in the first step, it's gonna get it at the data link layer. It's gonna look at and say, oh, I'm the next person for this. I am the intended recipient. Data link layer kicks it up to the network layer. The network layer looks at it and says, oh, but I'm not the final recipient. So I'm gonna bump it back down. Sorry, I'm gonna, yeah, that's fine. So here we have an example of this. I'm just gonna move this slide over. Okay. So the basic way that works, again, if I have an application that's sending out data, it's going to get chopped in at the transport layer, kicked down to the network layer, kicked down to the data link layer to get transmitted. Uh, at the various intermediate stops on the path, it's going to get received at the data link layer. Data link layer is going to look and say, yep, I'm the next stop for this message, bumps it up to the network layer. Network layer looks and says, but that's not for me. So back to the link layer you go. And it gets retransmitted to the next stop. And that can happen many times over the routing path until finally it gets to the machine that actually is the final destination, which receives the packet, looks at it, says, yep, this is for me, kicks it up to the network layer. The network layer says, aha, I am the final destination for this package, goes up to the transport layer. That packet gets added to the sequence for uh, that particular data stream. And eventually the application layer processes and receives the message. Okay. So that's uh, switching versus routing. Again, switching is what happens at the data link layer. Routing is what happens at the network layer. The primary reason why those two layers are separate is so they can run on different hardware. So you have switches are specific hardware for doing data link stuff. Routing, routers are specific hardware for connecting networks to each other. Okay, now the one that we actually use is TC. PIP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, or over internet pro using internet protocol. Uh, it basically has the same functions and sequence as OSI, but it groups them a little differently. So we'll talk about that, how it's a little different. So TCP IP only has four layers. First of all, the application layer. encompasses OSI app and pres and session players. Okay, so one uh, thing they don't have in TCP, they don't have to go in strict sequence and we can bypass steps if necessary, but the TCP application layer does all of these things. It gets data ready to be chopped up into packets, but there's a more flexible sequencing. Oh, I didn't want to put it down that low. Let's see. Better. Okay. The next TCP transport layer is basically the same. Okay. The network layer in TCP is called the internet layer, but that's fine. And again, basically the same. The addressing is done with uh, IP addresses. That's the TCP internet layer. 
And then in TCP, the data link layer is called just the link layer. So these are your four. There's only four layers. Now, TCP does not specify a physical layer, and this is a big difference. So I'm going to write this down here. TCP does not, doesn't specify a physical layer. The reason is, with modularity, as long as the link layer has correct output, the physical layer accepts it. Okay, that, that's the big point. As long as the physical layer, whatever device is there, it still uses physical layer devices like network cards. Uh, as long as it accepts the standard data stream, then yeah, there's no problem, right? The data link layer, the link layer in TCP will send the bit stream of packet data to the physical layer. Whatever it is, that's fine as long as the physical layer can handle it. So it doesn't need to specify the physical layer. And the important thing, This, uh, again, makes it much easier to develop hardware. So essentially, any physical layer device that can accept the standard data formats can be workable. And even in the 70s, the guys working on networking, they said, you know what? We have no idea what the future is going to hold as far as hardware. I mean, we can all be sure it's going to be a lot faster and better. But beyond that, we don't know what form it's going to take. And so it would be really presumptuous of us to try to specify what the physical layer, how it should be, because we don't know what's going to work in the future. Instead, we're going to say, as long as you accept this standard format, that's great. We're not going to hold you back. Okay. So again, TCP, four layers instead of the OSI seven layers. And these four layers actually only encompass the six top layers of the uh, OSI model. The physical layer is not actually not actually included. Okay. And TCP IP, again, widely used over the internet. If your whatever kind of computer system you're using, if you use TCP IP, it can exchange data with any other computer that also does. Okay. Four basic layers, application, transport, internet, and link, which we've covered. Message path, which we've covered. Okay. So comparison, TCP IP versus OSI. So TCP only has four layers, OSI has seven, right? The layer correspondence, TCP's application layer encompasses uh, OSI's presentation and session layers, but the sequence is more flexible. Again, I can, TCP can access these in a slightly different order. For example, it could do the session layer before the presentation. OSI can't do that, OSI forces that sequence. Uh, TCP IP transport layer is basically the same as OSI's. TCP's internet layer basically the same as OSI's network layer. And again, TCP's link layer basically the same as OSI's data link layer. However, TCP doesn't specify a physical layer. Now, for those of you that are interested in the history of technology, you can look up. I have an article here about how OSI basically missed the boat. Uh, they never were able to agree on things and thus never became the language of the, the protocol of the internet. Okay. So we covered a bunch of stuff here, and some of you are probably wondering, well, what's important and what isn't? Well, here are the key things that are important. Number one, what is the internet backbone? What are tier one, two, and three I ISPs? And what are peering and transit agreements? Okay, that's the basic uh, stuff for how the network is, are set up. Number two, what are APIs and what, why are they important to the internet? Well, APIs, application program interfaces, and we'll have more to say about that in some of the YouTube lectures. Why are they important to the internet? Well, they allow you build one translation device, basically, one translator, and it can allow a whole bunch of different technologies and applications to interface with each other. So in a sense, it makes everything on the internet able to speak the same language. What is routing and how are typical problems addressed? Well, routing is the process of getting packets or other data from one point to another in the network. Typically, problems are addressed by massive redundancy. So anytime you have, let's do a little bit of a talk about that. 
anytime you have some kind of routing path, right, from one endpoint to the other with, you know, devices in between, da, 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 something like that, each of these devices will actually, each of these intermediates will actually be a sequence of devices. So the truth, the truth of it, it looks more like this, right? So there are going to be different alternate paths all the way through. And same here, right? Instead of just being one path, each of these is going to have a set of options. So if any of these components break down, right? There's going to be multiple alternate paths to take. And again, there could even be entirely separate paths all around. So again, if something breaks, right? I have a bunch of different options. So it's not really a tree, it's a mesh, but at any different given point with TCP, you're going to build one route between the source and the destination, and you're gonna use that. Okay. What else? Uh, layered protocols. So what are layers? Well, layers are essentially modules that define a particular role, a particular action that needs to happen. So for example, you know, our uh, roles we covered for, Let's see if I can catch. Good. These layers, right? So application layer, it runs the application. Presentation layer handles the formatting issues, right? Session layer does these things. That's what layers are. They're a uh, basically a set of well-defined processes, and they're implemented as modules so that uh, outs other layers only need to worry about sending and receiving data in correct formats to and from other layers. And that's why they're separated. The nice thing about separated layers is that you can change a layer and you don't have to worry about it having any effect on other layers because it won't. It's as if inside your microwave, right, there's an interface you use there to tell it how long it's going to run. And if you put in a slightly different microwave generator on the inside that's going to, you know, put those zapping rays, but it's otherwise still going to work the same way, you on the outside as a user don't need to worry about that. Okay, for example, this is the sort of thing allows you to plug a new wireless card into your machine and still have it work the same way. Okay, two basic layered protocols. Number one, the OSI 7 layer model. Know what it is. Have an idea about the layers. Likewise, TCP IP. We know what the four layers are, what they do, and how it's different from the OSI model. So big picture, how are OSI and TCP IP different? Well, number one, Big picture stuff, TCP IP is just generally more flexible, even though we haven't gotten too far into the details of that. But the big two, again, this grouping here, I can complete these steps in a more flexible order. And number two, TCP didn't try to specify the physical layer. So in that sense, yeah, there's a lot more uh, flexibility there in how it's set up. Uh, what else? OSI has seven layers. Uh, TCP has four layers that correspond to six of the OSI layers. That's it. Okay, and this concludes our lecture. Well, I'm gonna stop the recording. Oh, if people have questions about the lecture, I'll ha happily answer them. Then I'm gonna handle some of these other issues. So any questions about the lecture itself? It's just, so in the seven layer OC model, uh, all these layers are run by your device, like your computer runs these, and then it sends a lot of information through the network, or it's run by another any other network after you send the information. Oh, uh, each stack here is for a particular machine, right? So this here on the left, I'm going to outline it in blue. This would, I was trying to, this would be all one machine. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is your machine. You want to send something from your machine to someone else's machine. On your machine, it's going to go through all these steps. And then it gets received by the other machine. It goes through all these steps. Okay, and just by, by, just by curiosity, what, how long it takes any device or computer to run all these processes? How many seconds? Not, not very long. I mean, people play real-time video games. You know, the to send through one packet is pretty quick, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you want to 
have like a couple gigs of data, that's going to take a while just because of the uh, network connection. But if you're just saying a little bit of data, I mean, it's fast enough to do, you know, real time video games, but they have to be pretty careful in only sending essential data. Because if they try to send too much, then yeah, it's going to get slowed down. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, in general, uh, operations that happen in RAM happen in microseconds or uh, sometimes even nanoseconds for super fast stuff. So this does not take very long. So timing timing wasn't the issue because TCP basically goes through the same set of steps. It's just TCP has more flexibility. That's the real trade-off. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> yep. All right. So uh, I guess that'll be it. Stop and